and welcome to this week's edition of Encompass Live. I am Krista Burns at the Nebraska Library Commission. Uh, Encompass Live is the Library Commission's weekly online event where we cover various um, Library Commission activities, library topics presented by Commission staff, and we have guest speakers sometimes. We do these sessions every Wednesday morning at 10 a.m. They're generally run for an hour officially, if they go that long, and they are recorded so you can watch, um, listen to them after the session is done. This morning, we, are, we have Susan Nicely here who's going to give us a tour of the new e-library. And I'll just shrink this up, and you're good to go. You can switch down, actually. Do you want to switch right over to the... Okay, let's just make sure that it's sharing... Just checking out the technicalities of this. Okay. <laughs> well, hello. This is Susan. I'm glad you all could be here today. Um, this is my first time using GoToMeeting, but Krista uh, assures me that it's very easy and intuitive, um, but I just want to warn you that I may fumble a little bit. If somebody asks a question, it may take me a second or two to notice and figure out how to... Uh, how to uh, read your entire question and get back to you, so hopefully that won't be a problem. Um, I would like to talk today about the new e-library interface, which um, was introduced on June 26th this summer. Um, some of you uh, have probably had a chance to look at it a little bit. I've spent quite a bit of time trying to explore it, and so hopefully I can um, highlight some of the new functionality functionality as well as review um, some of what uh, carries over from the old interface. Um, eLibrary uh, is one of several databases that the state pays for um, for access uh, on behalf of libraries across the state. Uh, eLibrary is a little different than some of the databases that we provide access to um, because uh, it is not licensed for use in K-12 schools e-library is available through public libraries and academic libraries and then certainly anyone who is a patron of a public or uh, academic library can get a username and password or I should say a Nebraska access password and access e-library from home as well. Uh, I'm going to take you into e-library through the new Nebraska access homepage. Again, um, this is something that hopefully most of you have had a chance to use. Uh, it's been available for quite a while, um, though the old Nebraska Access page did go away July 1st, so we do have some people who are, um, particularly K-12 schools that are coming back to school and uh, people are seeing it for the first time. So I did think I would start on the main Nebraska Access homepage and take you into eLibrary the way that uh, you and your patrons would normally access it. So this is the main Nebraska Access homepage. Um, in the past, you'll remember that uh, you had to choose between three login icons. There was a um, library icon, a login icon, and a K-12 school icon. And that was one of the things that we wanted to move away from when we redesigned Nebraska Access. And so now there is one link that people can click on to access the list of databases regardless of what type of institution they are affiliated with or where they are accessing the site from, um, be it home or school or um, from their vacation uh, resort in uh, Montana. So um, when you go to the Nebraska Access homepage, there's going to be uh, on the top right-hand column on every page, there is a link that says databases available to Nebraskans. And we've also included a little uh, login button just as a prompt to people who um, we're really used to clicking on that login button on the old Nebraska Access website. So you can either click on the login button or the text is also a link. So we'll click on the databases available to Nebraskans. This takes you to a page listing the particular databases that are available through the program. And you'll see eLibrary is listed at the top in the magazines and newspapers category. Um, eLibrary is a 100% full text database. And one of the reasons that it is unique is that it not only includes full-text articles for magazine and journals, it also 
includes full text articles from newspapers. Um, that means that it's very current and up to date. You can often find news stories that ran um, in yesterday's paper. So it's a great place for current events as in just happening. Um, it also includes TV and radio transcripts, audio video clips, uh, full text content from some reference books. So it's a little broader in terms of what it provides access to. Um, I'm going to go ahead and just click on the link to log into the database. And I will say that um, this is actually the point at which authentication occurs in the new e-library. Um, and we hopefully have streamlined this a bit so that your patrons, um, it'll be seamless for your patrons in many situations. If you've got IP access um, in your library and your patrons are accessing from the library, they'll get in automatically without being prompted for a username or a, um, a login. Um, if they are using it from home, then they'll get prompted for their Nebraska Access password. So let's go ahead and click in and hopefully our IP access will work, and it did. That would be embarrassing. Yeah. <laughs> um, this is the new uh, eLibrary homepage. Um, those of you who are familiar with the old eLibrary will see some differences. Um, the old eLibrary was a bit more colorful. They had uh, lots of different colored uh, icons on it for source types. Um, they've gone with a, a sleeker, uh, leaner look. I think they're really trying to capture that Google single search box look. So you have the basic search box, and then you have the source type icons down below that lets you limit your search to particular types of sources. So you can see by default um, all the different source types are included in your search, but you can um, change that by unchecking check boxes in order to, uh, for example, not include audio and video clips in your search results. One thing that you'll notice is missing from the new eLibrary homepage is the advanced search options. Uh, in the old eLibrary, uh, you used to have advanced search options on the lower half of the page. So patrons got the basic search options on the top of the page, and then they'd scroll down and see the advanced search options right away. Um, I personally have mixed feelings about this. I actually liked having the advanced search options on the main page because it put them right to their front and center in front of the patron mm -hmm. so that the, they knew there were options for narrowing and refining their search. Um, now um, ProQuest has moved the advanced, advanced search options to a separate page and my fear is really that patrons won't ever get beyond the basic search page and therefore they won't know that they can limit their search for example, by date or um, limit to a particular magazine or journal, those sorts of things. So, um, you know, that's something that you may have your own personal opinion about also, but that is one of the changes uh, in the new e-library. Um, just as in the past, uh, you can click on the source type icons at this point if you want to see uh, title lists. So if you want to see, for example, a list of all the newspapers that are included in eLibrary, you can just come down here and click on the newspapers icon. And this is actually something I always encourage people to spend a little time doing uh, because I think it helps you get a sense of the depth and breadth of coverage in eLibrary when you see the types of publications that are included. Um, the newspaper list is alphabetical, and if you scroll through it, you'll see that there are newspapers from lots of different cities in the United States. There are also newspapers from other countries, um, news services, wire services. Um, if you look through the list, you'll really start getting a sense of what sort of information you can get access to. And it does, it's a good reminder that um, you can maybe get a perspective uh, from some of these articles that's different than what you might get in um, just uh, straight U.S. publications. You can get an international perspective. Um, you can scroll through the A's and then go to the B's, etc. cetera. Um, I'm just going to go ahead and jump to the O's because I do want to emphasize the fact that the Omaha World Herald is included in this uh, database. And that's very good news for us in Nebraska because it does allow us to 
search this database and get some local coverage. Um, there are going to be articles in the whole Omaha World Herald about local issues that would never make it into national publications like Time or Newsweek. So that is good to know about if you have a patron that's coming in looking for something uh, that's specifically uh, Nebraska related. When you click on a title, you'll actually get some coverage information. So it tells you that coverage runs from February 26, 2004 through August 17, 2009. So you'll see um, we've got uh, content from two days ago. So it is updated very quickly. And then they do have some older issues that are um, included, but you can't necessarily count on every issue prior to February 2004 being included. Excuse me. You can see here they do list all of the daily issues that are included. So if I wanted to come in and, for instance, look at all of the articles from the August 17, 2009 Omaha World Herald, I can click on that link and it will pull them up. And uh, it looks like they've got 27 results. And to me, that looks uh, small. So I would say they're just in the process of loading. Uh, August 17th issue and not all of the articles are available yet, just based on my experience of how many articles you usually find in a particular issue. But Okay, I'm going to go ahead and click on the eLibrary e logo and jump back to the main search screen and go ahead and start talking about searching. Whoops. Somehow I got jumped to the advanced search screen. Let's go back to the basic. Um, the first search that I'm going to do is going to allow me to show you uh, something that eLibrary added that's new. Um, basically what they've done is they have added something that they call smart content or essential pages. Um, these essential pages are actually created by editors at ProQuest and the way they describe it is it's their attempt to bring best of resources front and center and to provide context for the most frequently studied and queried topics. So they've gone in and they've, they've thought about what, what topics do people typically search on, um, what are topics that students typically write reports on or, or are interested in. And they have created some pre-packaged uh, collections of resources on those particular topic areas. So I'm going to go ahead and type in a search that I, that I know will bring up one of those pages so you can get a sense of what it looks like. So global warming. Now typically your patrons are going to stumble on these essential pages just as a result of searching on one of these topics. Um, but I will show you in a minute how you yourself can find a list of all of the topics that they're available for. So when you do a search and it matches one of those essential pages topic areas, uh, you will get one of these uh, pages or documents at the top of your result list. Um, you do have to expand it to see the full thing. This is fairly typical of what you can expect. Um, each page opens with what they call a high impact image from their image uh, collection and also a key article that provides in-depth information on the topic. So you've got the start of the article right here. They give you the first couple paragraphs and then there's a link for more. And when you click on it, it takes you to the full text of the article. In this case, uh, it was an article uh, written by Al Gore uh, that originally appeared in Rolling Stone magazine. And the one thing that I uh, that drives me crazy is every time you uh, come back to this page you have to re-expand the document so mm -hmm. that's just a personal um, annoyance on my part. Um, if you scroll down you'll see what they call their gallery and again, these are a few additional images from their image collection that relate to the topic area. If you click on one of the images, uh, you will get a brief uh, description of it, and you will also include get, get uh, a link to uh, the full-size JPEG uh, of the image. 
And I did sit in on some online training sessions that ProQuest uh, held on the new eLibrary interface. And they did specifically talk about the fact that this full-size JPEG link is included because it's going to be useful to students who might want to download the picture and use in a report. So, mm -hmm. you know, they're well aware that that is the use that um, students are going to make of it and they intend that. So they are well aware of, you know, the fair use and the educational fair use and um, are trying to uh, facilitate students being able to use the images that way. Okay, we're going to go back to our page and expand it. Um, underneath images, you'll have a few uh, links to articles in the reading section and basically what the editors have tried to do is find a handful of some of the best articles on the topic, articles that are going to give the uh, user a good background and overview of the topic area. So um, history of the topic area, um, if it's a controversial uh, topic, they'll look for articles that present both the pro and the con articles that include statistics, etc. So they have uh, gone and searched for some of the best articles and present those uh, front and center. Uh, in this case, you've got a couple of little uh, animated graphics that uh, your patrons can look at and use. Um, this particular essential page doesn't include it, but there are often uh, links to uh, editor-selected websites in the topic area, too. So you can see how if uh, someone is uh, trying to do a report on a topic, this essential page could be very helpful as a good starting point. Uh, the editor's goal was to have a thousand of these essential pages in place by the end of June when the new interface went live. And then um, their intention is to continue to add more pages on an uh, ongoing basis. Um, now at this point, what I want to do is actually show you how you can access a list of all of the topic areas that essential pages exist for. Um, and I just want to do this because it's not at all intuitive, and I haven't found um, any place where it tells you how to do this. So I sort of stumbled around and figured this out, and so I'll go ahead and share it with you. Um, if you do want to see a list of all of the topic areas that essential pages exist for, um, you do have to click on this Publications tab up at the top of the page. And the default um, option for viewing publications is by name, and that's what you want. You want to select P, and you scroll through the P's until you get to a link that says ProQuest Essentials. Here it is right here. And if you click on this link, then this is the point at which you'll get a list of the different topic areas. Um, it's going to be what you'd probably expect, everything from volcanoes to um, gun control to um, 1918 flu epidemic, 9-11 attacks. Um, there are even uh, you know, pop culture figures like Angelina Jolie has an essential page um, for her. So. Um, it, it, it's really amazing all the different topic areas they do have these pages for. Sounds like it's a good case for uh, making a suggestion to the ProQuest of uh, this may be something you might want to highlight a little better in your interface. Right, and hopefully yeah, they... Update to it. Yeah, it would be nice if they'd include a link uh, someplace that said, see all the essential yeah. pages, see all the pages we have ProQuest essential pages created for. So. But anyway, um, maybe you'll be one of the select few who know how to get access to that information. <laughs> um, again, as Krista said, if you do have questions as we go along, feel free to ask them. Um, you can either uh, unmute yourself and ask uh, using your microphone or do the text chat. Um, right now, I'm going to go ahead and actually go back and do a more standard search. Um, that doesn't necessarily uh, pull up one of those essential pages. I'm going to go ahead and do a search for tree nut allergies. And I will say this basic search search box uh, lets you enter searches. It, it is, uh, accepts keywords, short phrases. Um, it, 
is optimized for natural language searches, so you can actually type in a search statement in the form of a question that you might be asking. I'm going to go ahead and click on search. And this is what the result page looks like. Um, it tells you that it is going to show you result records 1 through 25 out of 208 total results. Um, you do have a little preferences option here and you can change the number of results displayed per page if you so choose. Um, if you direct your attention over to the left side of the screen, um, we'll go over some of the options over here. Um, you do have sort options. The default sort order is relevance. Uh, one of the other sort options that I sometimes use it, um, is date. Um, if you click on the date sort option, it will bring the most current material to the top of your result list, and that is something that I sometimes want to do. Um, just personally, I find that I don't use the other sort options very often. Um, size is basically just the length of the article. I've played around a lot with reading level since it seems like it would be a very appealing uh, limit option, mm -hmm. but in my experience I haven't found their uh, reading level designations uh, haven't always seemed accurate to me, and so I tend not to use that one. Uh, document title is just alphabetical by title, and then publication name is alphabetical by magazine or journal name, so those I tend not to use. Keyword score is somewhat similar to relevance, um, but it just, uh, I think, sorts your results based on the sheer number of times your search terms appear in the article, whereas relevance um, factors in a few more um, factors. So between keyword score and relevance, I haven't quite figured out why you would use keyword score instead of relevance. So um, my recommendation would be just to use relevance. Um, down below that, um, you have an area that shows you how your results are distributed among the different source types. So um, out of our 208 results, eight results come from newspapers, we have no pictures, 189 results from magazines, etc. Um, you can also uh, use this area to sort your results by source type. So for instance, if I wanted to bring the nine transcripts to the top of my result list, I could click on transcripts and that would do that. Uh, next you have a uh, topic cloud that shows you uh, some of the topic areas that these articles fall into. So um, that would be another way to refine your search if you wanted to then go ahead and click on allergies, basics, and overviews. Um, then you get all of the articles that have been assigned to that particular topic area. So again, another way to refine a search result. Uh, at the very bottom, you have access to a couple of the uh, options that you would also get access to in the advanced search screen. You can limit your search by a uh, date range, and then you can also uh, choose to include newspaper articles that are older than 90 days. Um, what I think is significant about this option is what it implies, um, which is that when you do a basic search, um, you're only going to be retrieving articles, newspaper articles, uh, that were published in the last 90 days. So that's something that you don't necessarily see when you do a basic search, but it is something to be aware of. If you're searching for a topic area that would have been written about more than 90 days ago, um, you're going to need to make sure that you um, use this option. Otherwise, you're, not, you're going to miss the content that's actually there. Okay, moving over to the actual search results. Um, something new that eLibrary has done is they've added something called Document Preview. To the right of each uh, record, you can see the little magnifying glass, and if you hold your mouse over it, you get a little pop-up window that shows you a preview of the article. Um, if, based on the preview, it looks like something you want to read um, in its entirety, you can just uh, click with your left mouse button, and that pulls up the entire article. Um, once you're looking at the article, 
you have some additional options. Uh, you can email the article to yourself or someone else. They do ask you to provide your name, email addresses, a subject line, and a brief message. You have a print option, a print view, and basically what that does is it reformats the article, gets rid of some of the graphics, and then you do need to use your browser uh, print functionality to actually uh, send the document to the, to the printer. They have a citation view. Um, the limitation is that they only show you MLA format, how to cite this particular article found through eLibrary using MLA format. So, um, if that's the citation format your patron needs, that's great. Um, if not, this option is not going to appeal to them that much. Um, over to the right, again, is a new functionality that was added uh, when they updated the interface at the end of June, and that is an ability to translate the document uh, into one of ten different languages. So. They allow you to translate into Chinese, French, German, uh, Italian, Japanese, etc. I'm just going to go ahead and uh, do English to Spanish. It takes a few minutes to translate, um, or a few seconds to translate. But again, this is going to be useful if you do have patrons uh, who don't speak English as their first language. Uh, or students who are taking foreign language classes in school. That might be something that would be of interest to them. So you can see the article has been translated. Um, I'll point out right here uh, the jump to best part of document option. Um, this is kind of a unique uh, feature of eLibrary. They've had it um, as long as I can remember. Um, and I always tell people that sometimes it is really valuable and really uh, works well, and other times it doesn't make that much difference. Mm -hmm. um, if you are, uh, what it does is it jumps you down to the part of the document that contains the highest concentration of your search terms. Um, in a situation where you are doing a search and you're just looking for articles that are going to give you general background information on the topic area, um, you're basically going to need to read the whole article in order to meet your information need. But there are other times when you might be looking for an uh, isolated fact. Maybe you type in, what's the, tall, what's the highest mountain in the world? In situations like that, go to best part can actually often drop you down to the portion of the article that provides the answer to your question. Um, so it saves you from reading the whole article on mountains, for instance. You can just jump right to the part that talks about the height of the tallest mountain. So um, it's kind of nice to be aware of. I'll just point out right here, um, you have the option to add the document to uh, my list, so you can keep a running list of uh, articles as you go along. Um, you also have the checkbox um, to the left of each or, or below each um, record on the results screen too. So there are two places where you can add articles to a list. Scrolling down to the bottom of the article, I just want to show you document topics. Um, eLibrary is a little bit different than some other databases in that they don't assign subject headings to particular articles. Instead, what ProQuest has done is they have come up with what they call a topic tree. It's basically their subject taxonomy, and they assign articles to particular branches of that topic tree. And this shows you um, three branches that this particular article has been assigned to. So infection, treatment, and prevention, allergies, immunodeficiency, and allergies, basics, and overviews. So that's how they do their subject categorization. Um, if you click on one of these um, topic area links, then you would retrieve all the other articles that have also been assigned to that branch of the topic tree. So again, that's another way to search, another way to refine your search. Um, scrolling back to the top, um, again, if anybody's got any questions, let me know. Um, I'm going to go ahead now and go back to the main search screen and take a brief look at the advanced search options. So 
going to click on advanced search. Um, here you do see that natural language search is the default search option, but they do give you the option of switching to Boolean search mode if you want to do a more formal type of search using and, or, and not. Um, you'll see right here it says include newspaper articles older than 90 days, and that's automatically checked when you go to the advanced search screen. So the advanced search screen automatically does include older articles. So that is one difference between the basic search and the advanced search. You'll see there's also an option to search within scholarly journals only. So if you do have students, um, you know, college students, uh, people doing graduate work who need more research-oriented articles, this would be an important option to make them aware of. And you'll notice when you check that option, all the source type icons other than magazine, um, the checkbox is unchecked under them. So. You can limit to scholarly articles. Uh, I see you have a question. Uh, Go ahead and click on that again, and maybe you'll see the, where the little flashy thing is at the very bottom of the interface. Ah, yeah. There we go. OK. Let me read your question, Linda. The question is, um, I find many of my patrons never venture beyond Google and Wikipedia when they look for information. What can I let them know to encourage them to use this resource? Um, that's the million dollar question <laughs> that everybody struggles with. Um, I don't know if anybody else has any good ideas. Um, I would say if particularly if someone's having trouble finding information on a topic area and they do come to you, that's a good opportunity oh, yeah. to show them another option. Um, if you do any sort of little mini classes ever, offer, offer a class and come see how to get access to, you know, you know maybe, maybe list some popular magazines that are included in e-library and say, you know, get access to all these magazines at your fingertips, mm -hmm. something that's going to, and don't you guys have um, promotional materials on in um, Nebraska Access for some of these databases too that people can use? Yeah, we do have some promotional material in Nebraska Access. Um, for instance, we do have we've got in um, we've got some handouts that are keyed to particular um, topic areas. For instance, if you want information on agriculture. You know, here are some agriculture magazines and journals that you'll find, get access to through these particular publications. And I'm trying to remember if we've gotten those updated to correspond to the new Nebraska Access yet or not. But um, that, those, are the, those are the ways that we've tried to help you. Yeah, it's hard too, I know, when the patrons don't come to you, so you don't get to intercept their I'm just going to go to Google mm -hmm. <laughs> um, idea. Um, so a lot of times just having the promotional things, the flyers lying around, um, a display of, are you looking for information from journals or newspapers? Here's where you can go. And say, we've got this data, and that would be your, your, your um, flyer would say, this database, this system, and not mentioning the other things, Google and Wikipedia, which sometimes can be perfectly acceptable depending on what level they need. But um, just have that stuff out there for those people that don't even come to you. Um, catch their eyes, posters, signs, flyers, whatever. Yeah, it's really a, it's, it's a battle. It's a battle, <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. And somebody said, yeah, mentioning it in an Internet Basics class would be a good, you know, you get access to this over the Internet, but it's something special that our library provides you that you wouldn't necessarily get. Mm -hmm you know, if, if you weren't affiliated with our library, so. And for some people, it might catch their attention. This just popped into my head. Um, <clears throat> this is your own tax dollars at work. Your, the, the, the state of Nebraska pays for you guys to have access to these databases. So, you know, give them that little nudge. Of, yeah. Hey, did you know that your state pays for, yeah, it offers these free day, uh, um, you know, uh, services to you? You've already paid for it by paying your taxes. Yeah. Appeal to their pocketbook, maybe. Yeah. <laughs>
So. Thanks for the question, Linda. Yeah. Good, good thing, a good uh, issue to bring up, definitely. Absolutely. Um, I do really like the date range option in eLibrary because you're often doing a very broad search, and um, you know you have you can have articles dating back um, 14 years. Sometimes you know you only want information from the last couple years, so being able to come onto the advanced search screen and say date range after. And then you can select a month, and a day, and a year. That makes such, whoopsie, I think here we go. Um, you know, that makes such a difference um, in terms of the quality of your search results. Um, here's an area where um, it lets you actually limit your search to a particular topic area. And again, these are the topic areas that um, you saw at the bottom of a search result, at, at the bottom of an article. Um, this is probably fairly advanced and esoteric search option, so it might be something that you would remember to take advantage of if you're really struggling to find good results for a patron, but I'm not sure how many of them would take advantage of it. Um, if someone comes in with an actual uh, citation to an article that they're trying to track down, you can type in uh, the document title, the author's name. It does let you limit by reading level, except, like I said, I'm not quite convinced about the reading level options. Just, uh, for, uh, just as an experiment, I went in and I, I did a search and I limited it to the scholarly journal articles and early elementary reading level and I got quite a few hits so that there lets you know that it's sort of suspect. <laughs> um, and then finally, and this is a very important option, you can limit your search by publication name. So someone comes in and they say, I saw an article in Time Magazine on this topic, can you help me? Or, you know, I saw an article in the Omaha World Herald. This is where you can come and actually type that in. So I can type Omaha World Herald down here. And then up at the top in the search box, I can type in uh, search terms that would hopefully match something in the article I'm looking for. So I could type in um, Ricketts and Cubs Baseball. Since the Ricketts family, it sounds like, was trying to buy or is trying to buy the Cubs baseball team, so go ahead and do that search. And it's going to limit it to just articles that appeared in the Omaha World Herald. And because we were using the advanced search screen, it does search for articles older than 90 days. And actually that's good in this case because um, I went through and looked and the, only two of these articles were published within the last 90 days. So um, you can see what a difference that particular um, toggle can make. Okay, going to move on. Move on to the topics tab here. Um, we've talked a little bit about the topics area, the, the, the topic tree that eLibrary uses to categorize their articles. This is where you can actually look at it. And they have provided you with several ways to uh, search using it. So you can browse the topic tree. Um, you've got the broad topic areas listed, and then you can drill down to try to find the narrower topic area that describes your area of interest. So if I was looking for articles on weather forecasting, you know, I might, um, it's pretty logical to guess it might be under science. I click on science, I get narrower topic areas. And I would need to look through these and figure out which um, narrower topic area to look at. Um, so probably earth science maybe. And there's climatology over here to the right and down at the bottom is meteorology, so a couple options there. So I can drill down this way to get results. Or I can use, um, if I go back to the topics homepage, I can use this little search box. And what this does is it actually, it just searches the um, 
topic tree area. It doesn't search the articles themselves. So if I type in weather and click on search, it will show me just the branches of the topic tree that contain the term weather. So that's another way to sort of uh, drill down. So I can look at these links and maybe I'll decide um, I'm interested in weather basics. Um, I can show the topic path if I want, and it was under meteorology, weather and weather phenomena. I can click on weather basics. I see the whole um, branch of the topic tree, and then I can click on view results. Um, situations where this might be useful, um, you can imagine if you just went to the basic search screen and typed in the term weather, you're going to get all kinds of articles, based, basically anything that contains the word weather. And so you could get some very um, narrow, advanced articles on the topic that aren't basic at all. If you go this right route, your chances are that you're going to get more basic um, introductory articles. Okay, I do want to move on then, and I want to go back to the Publications tab. Again, we've talked about that a little bit. Um, we've already um, browsed by name, alphabetic, alphabetically by name. Um, we've done by type um, when we clicked on the source type icon. Um, but a new option they give you when viewing publications is to view publications by subject area. And this is actually, I think, really valuable. Um, you'll see here you've got a list of subject areas. If you click on something like agriculture, it's going to show you all the magazines and journals and other sources that are specifically focused on the topic of agriculture. Um, this, I think, is a way that you could possibly appeal to particular people in your community and convince them of the value of this resource. Um, if you're going and talking to a particular group that has a particular area of interest, um, if you can find topic areas that correspond to that area of interest, you could bring a list for them of the magazines and journals that would apply to their area of interest um, and show them and say, you get access to these through eLibrary. So I think the subject area um, option really has a lot of potential as far as being able to show people, okay, look, these are all area. These are all magazines or journals in your field of um, your field of um, expertise. So you might want to keep up with them through e-library as opposed to individual subscriptions. Um, you also can uh, search for a publication. So if I just quickly want to find out is Rolling Stone um, included in e-library, I can type that in here, and it just uh, whoopsie. I have to jump back to my name here. Sorry. And it shows me Rolling Stone is included. So a couple ways to um, uh, browse the publication list. Finally, over here to the right is a reference tab. And this, again, has some great applications. Um, if you've got, uh, particularly if you've got someone that just needs a general introduction to a topic area, and I think particularly of students who are doing reports, um, having them do a search in the, um, in the general search uh, screen, they're going to get all kinds of articles, some of them basic and some of them very narrow and focused. Um, if you come to the reference tab area, what you're going to be doing is you're going to be limiting your search to a subset of the book to a book content, specifically reference sources. If you want to see which sources you're searching, you can click on this View Reference Desk Sources link, and you'll see it'll be two dictionaries, two thesauri, thesauruses, um, some encyclopedias, almanacs, etc. So you're searching a subset of the reference content. Uh, so, for instance, say someone wants some general uh, introductory information on Buddhism. Uh, when I did a search on Buddhism on the main uh, search screen, I got lots of articles about the, the Dalai Lama and different political um, activities that he's involved with, not really an introduction to what is Buddhism. If you come here and do your search, you are going to get 
dictionary definition from the American Heritage Dictionary. You're also going to get articles from the DKE Encyclopedia, Britannica Concise Encyclopedia, Young Students Learning Library. Um, these are just general introductions to the topic. Here's a specialized encyclopedia, Religions of the World. You go in here and you have just what you can imagine the patron would want. You've got history of Buddhism, beliefs, uh, concept of God, sacred writings, symbols, types of Buddhism, you know, just all the basic categories of information the patron might want. So that reference tab is actually um, comes in quite handy um, in, in certain situations. Okay, the last thing I want to talk about is, uh, again, it's a new feature of eLibrary. It is something called My eLibrary. Um, and the primary value of this, in my mind, is that it allows you to save uh, lists of articles that you compile beyond your current session. Um, in the past, um, you were able to do, uh, to create lists of articles. I think you could uh, save 20, up to 25 articles to a list, but that list, you had to do something with it during your current session. You had to print it out or email it to yourself or something because as soon as you logged off of eLibrary, that list went away. Um, so that has limited use if you're doing long-term research. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and just add some, check some articles to add to a list here. Check a couple, and I go up here and I click on my list. And it will show me the articles that I added to my list, but then it also tells me your current list is unsaved and will be discarded when you exit eLibrary or close your browser. To save your list, either log into My eLibrary or create a new My eLibrary account. So now they give you the option to save your lists, and so I think that's very valuable. Um, I do have an account, so I'm going to go ahead and log in. Um, you could have gotten to the same screen by clicking on the My eLibrary tab up here at the top also. So And just to show you, the um, option to sign up appears right below the login option. So it's very simple. It just wants your name, username, password, and uh, a security question. OK, so here is my um, eLibrary homepage. And um, I have a list called Vision Therapy here. Um, so I'm going to click on Vision Therapy, and these are articles that I have added um, in the past, so I can continue to add to this list um, with my new information if I want. Um, let's see, let's go back to my list here. Okay, so here's my list. Now that I've logged into my eLibrary account, you'll see I have the option of saving this as a new list by giving it a new name. Or I can add these articles to my existing list. So I'm going to click on Save to add them to my existing list. Um, I can jump to my eLibrary and view all of my lists. Here's my vision therapy list. And so you know, that's really nice if you're doing ongoing research. You, you can keep that list of articles going from one session to another. The other thing that um, you can do when you log into your eLibrary account is you'll see up at the top of the document page you have an option that you didn't see before we were logged in, and that is to take notes. So you could actually take notes um, on the particular article that interests you. So here are, um, these are uh, symptoms that may uh, cause you to think that maybe your child has a vision problem. So say I want to mark that. 
I could click on Take Notes. Um, I can do a summary note, which is just a general note affiliated with the article, or I can do an inline note, which allows me to um, pinpoint a particular part of the article that I want the note associated with. So I can come down here and say, click right by this list and say, well, let's see. I'm just going to do signs of possible vision problems. And I'm not, I could put more text up here, but I'm just going to put a title there and save. You'll see it puts that little um, pin right uh, next to that section of the article. And you know when I click on that, my little note comes up. And so any text that I typed in would appear there. Um, I can stop taking notes. Um, you'll see the um, within the article, if you go back and look at that article, you can also um, see a list of all the articles you've um, added notes to. Again, you go to your My eLibrary homepage, and you'll see up here it says Saved Notes. And so I have a list of um, several notes that I've added. You know, I can just click on the note and it, it um, pops those up so I can see. Um, I, I think this would be really useful to people who are working on papers. Um, you know, lots of times you're reading an article and you see a particular sentence or paragraph that you can tell is going to perfectly support your thesis um, and you want to make sure you remember that. Um, if you stick a note in there, um, then you'll be able to find that paragraph again as opposed to printing off all the articles, going home, um, getting out your highlighter and trying to refine that particular passage. So um, I actually think the note-taking feature is a nice addition as well. Um, we're about out of time, and that is actually the end of my um, list of topics to cover with eLibrary. Um, does anybody have any questions they'd like to ask at this point? Well, do feel free to get, uh, get in touch with me if you do have follow-up questions. Um, hopefully, you'll, um, hopefully you'll pick up a few new tips and we'll be able to find some time to play around with eLibrary. Mm -hmm. So um, I think that's it for this week's session. Okay. Nothing else. Okay. Um, yeah, if anybody doesn't have any other oh, is a few questions, um, you can uh, contact Susan. Here's your um, <clears throat> new email address and um, 800 number here at the Commission. Feel free to give a call or contact her with any questions or anything else you want to know about it as you're using it. She can help you through that. Um, thank you very much for attending. Uh, the session was recorded so you can listen to it and watch it again and, and go through what um, Susan had <laughs> done. Um, we hope you'll join us next week um, when our topic will be an update to the Wilson databases that Alana Novotny will be doing for us. Um, you're welcome. We've got a couple of thank yous there. <laughs> thank you very much for attending, and um, maybe we'll see you next time. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye.